This episode is brought to you by my very first book, The Fifth Vital Sign, Master Your Cycles and Optimize Your Fertility. With over 1,000 research citations, it is the most comprehensive resource on fertility awareness and the menstrual cycle to date. The Fifth Vital Sign is available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook formats on Amazon.com. Listen to The Fifth Vital Sign for free when you sign up for a 30-day trial with Audible. Visit fertilityfriday.com slash audible for details. That's fertilityfriday.com slash audible. This episode is brought to you by my free three-part video series, FAM 101. Discover how to chart your cycles by tracking the three main fertile signs, cervical mucus, basal body temperature, and cervical position, and ultimately develop body literacy by paying attention to your fertile signs. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash FAM 101 to grab your free copy. That's fertilityfriday.com slash FAM 101. This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 258. Welcome to the 258th episode of the Fertility Friday Podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm excited to share today's episode with you. In today's episode, we are talking about BBT, basal body temperature. It is a question or a topic rather that I get questions about nearly every single day. And it's fascinating to me how complicated and confusing temperature can can be because on the surface, it, it seems really simple, right? You just get up in the morning and you take your temperature. But of course, like everything else, there's a lot more to it than that. So we'll get into some of the nitty gritty details today. And you'll find more information about basal body temperature in the fifth vital sign. And as you heard in the introduction to today's episode, the fifth vital sign is now available in audiobook format. And I'm just thrilled to be able to share that with you. The audiobook has been in the works for a little while, and I'm just really excited that we were able to, you know, finish the production and get it out there. If you're anything like me, you do a lot of reading on the go. So for me, I am often the one waiting for the audiobook to come out. <laughs> and then once it comes out, I'm actually able to, to read the whole book at that in that case. And so if that is you, I, <laughs> I knew you were out there and that's why I made the audiobook available. And so you can actually get the audiobook for free if you don't have an Audible subscription yet. If you haven't gone completely down the rabbit hole of audiobooks, you can actually head over to fertilityfriday.com slash audible. So that's fertilityfriday.com slash audible. And then you can actually get the link to download the book for free with an audible trial. So if you have never, you know, delved into the world of audiobooks, this can actually be your first foray. And so again, that's fertilityfriday.com slash audible. Now let's jump into today's episode. So before we get into the top 10 questions about BBT, I wanted to start by just getting into it a little bit and talking a little bit about what BBT is, why we measure it, and how it helps us to identify what's happening in our menstrual cycle. So what it does and what it doesn't do. And so, you know, for those of you, I think a lot of you are familiar with it, but BBT, basal body temperature, is a measure of your body's resting metabolism. And so in order to get an accurate basal body temperature reading, you would ideally take it after you have been in a state of rest for five hours or more to allow your body to get back to that very baseline level of metabolism. And so by measuring your metabolism, you can get, uh, you know, of course, the reason that we measure it as it pertains to fertility is because after you ovulate, you release a significant amount of progesterone. And the progesterone that you produce in your post-ovulatory phase actually has a thermogenic effect on the body. So it causes your temperature to rise and stay high until either, you know, one of two things (laughs) happens. So either you are not pregnant and your uh, corpus luteum stops producing progesterone and you start, you basically get your period. And so that would happen about 12 to 14 days after ovulation. Or if you do get pregnant, then what would happen is you are pregnant. So you would continue producing progesterone throughout the rest of your 
pregnancy. And so your temperature would actually increase a little bit, especially in those early weeks of pregnancy. Uh, and so that's, that's basically one of two things that can happen. But what's really interesting about basal body temperature and what makes it a really helpful sign of fertility to pay attention to, particularly when you're using the fertility awareness method, is that it gives you this way that, you know, a very accurate way that you can actually identify when ovulation happens in the cycle, albeit retroactively. So because the basal body temperature reading is measuring your, you know, your resting metabolism. And because your temperature increases, your resting body metabolism increases after ovulation as a result of your progesterone production, this BBT measure doesn't give you any type of, you know, heads up. It doesn't give you an early warning or anything like that, but it does help you to confirm ovulation after the fact. So when you're taking your temperatures and you see, you know, a clear and obvious shift from lower temperatures to higher temperatures in your cycle that is sustained for the remainder of your cycle, then you can be fairly confident that you ovulated, you know, the day before the shift. Now, you know, the the best way to, the most scientific and accurate way to tell when you ovulated would be to have an ultrasound and ultimately have an ultrasound, you know, every day of your cycle so that you can really tell exactly, you know, when it occurred. But really taking your temperature is the second best thing. Uh, to that because it gives you a highly accurate way of measuring, of identifying when ovulation likely occurred uh, in your cycle with, you know, obviously very low tech equipment. And so that essentially is what basal body temperature is. And so how do you get an accurate measure of your temperature? Well, you know, there's a few things that need to happen. So we already mentioned the first, which is ideally you're going to get at least five hours of uninterrupted sleep and you're going to take your temperature first thing in the morning before you get out of bed. So that's kind of like the first aspect of this. And um, but one of the aspects that I think a lot of us don't really realize or don't really know about is that it's actually really helpful when you're looking to get an accurate temperature to warm up the thermometer a little bit before you, you know, take that temperature. So with our modern digital thermometers, you push the button and the temperature, you know, the little beep is happening and the temperature is being measured within 30 seconds or less. But if you were to say, put, pop the thermometer in your mouth and, you know, take that temperature and then wait, you know, a minute and take it again and wait a minute and take it again, you would get three different readings. So my third suggestion often gets the most flack (laughs) from my clients, uh, but it is to hold the thermometer in your mouth for 10 minutes before you push the button to allow the temperature to stabilize, the thermometer to warm up, and then what happens is you get a much more accurate reading of temperature. Don't believe me? That's okay. Most people don't. You know, what you can do if you think that that wouldn't make a difference at all would be to quite literally try it out. So do one week your way and do one week my way and then tell (laughs) tell me what the results are. Because, you know, as all I can say is after all these years, the proof is in the pudding. It actually works. Okay. So let's talk about some of the most common factors that can affect your temperature readings, because really this is the part that is, I think, the most challenging, because one of the things I think it's actually helpful to start this conversation by saying that uh, you you might want to kind of check some of your expectations of charting at the door. When it comes to charting, a lot of us are really motivated to have these perfect looking charts. And I think for a lot of women after, you know, you learn about fertility awareness and you read about it and you see these sample charts and you see what and hear what, you know, normal typical cycle should look like. We all have this idea that it's supposed to be the same every time. And it's supposed to have this perfect pattern. And honestly, like you and I might have a different idea of what a perfect quote unquote pattern would be. But, you know, when it comes to temperature, especially temperature is highly variable and that makes it a useful way to monitor your fifth vital sign because it is actually receptive to the different things that are going on. And you can glean a lot of really helpful and interesting information from your temperature. So instead of thinking about trying to get everything perfect and trying to make sure that the chart is as perfect as possible and there's no disruptions in your temperature, I would encourage you to embrace the fact that there will be disruptions in your temperature. And if you chart as long as I do, have, you know, if you chart for, you know, a couple of several years, five, 10 years or more, you'll find that nearly every single cycle, there is one kind of random temperature or one random type of observation that doesn't necessarily fit neatly on the chart. That's just life. And I would encourage you to embrace that and to let that expectation go. First of all, you you shouldn't expect that the temperature should just be perfect. And, you know, every single, every single day and every single cycle. 
Okay, so there's a number of different factors that can affect your temperature readings. And also every woman isn't the same. So there are certain items that I'll list where some women would really have it affect them quite significantly, whereas others not so much. You know, stress, illness, or fever, I think it's an obvious one. If you're sick and you have a fever, obviously your temperature will be disrupted. But if you work different hours, if you do shift work, if you are woken up in the middle of the night once or a couple of times, if you're a restless sleeper, or if you have a restless night of sleep, alcohol consumption the previous day, it can affect the temperature quite significantly in some women. Travel, if you're in a, an airplane at some point, if you change time zones, if there's even a t- daylight savings time disruption. So something regarding either traveling uh, you know, outside of wherever you live and also something about time changing or you know, just going somewhere new, that can affect your temperature. And then get, waking up at different times, things like that. Food allergies, seasonal allergies and food sensitivities. So what I often say is that anytime something triggers your immune system, you could anticipate uh, some sort of change in your temperature reading. So even, for example, if you have an allergic reaction and you have to get a cortisone shot or something like that, anytime you get an injection of some kind, especially if it's steroids or hormonal or different things that could affect your immune system, have a triggering effect on that, will you, you'll often see that reflected in your temperatures. So also taking your temperature after you've gotten out of bed, drinking water or tea in the morning if you take your temperature orally, so anything that would change the temperature of your mouth, switching how you take your temperature, so getting a new thermometer, going from oral temperature taking to underarm temperature taking, and just all those different types of things can affect it. So these aren't the only things that can affect it, but these are the things that come to mind most commonly of what can affect your temperature readings. And at the beginning of the show, I probably should have mentioned that one of the ways to get an accurate temperature readings when you're trying to kind of do that proper temperature taking is to uh, take it from one of three main locations. So the vast majority of women who I've worked with, they take their temperature orally. The close second would be underarm. And then some women take their temperature vaginally. And so outside of those three locations, I mean, those that's where you're going to measure your basal body temperature. And so outside of those three locations, you may or may not be getting as accurate of a reading. And now I think would be a good time to go into the top 10 questions that I get about BBT. Again, this is not a complete list. I could have had this podcast go on for probably two and a half hours to answer all the questions that I've ever had about basal body temperature. But these are the ones that came to mind quickly. These are the ones that I get the most. So these are the ones we're going to go through. Uh, So number one, it's a basic question, but I still get it a lot. What kind of thermometer should I use? And so I think it's helpful just to kind of put it out there. I mean, I started charting a long time ago before there were all these different apps and and different things. And so what I can tell you is that you don't need a fancy thermometer to chart. If you want a fancy thermometer because you appreciate all the different features and things like that, that is completely awesome and, and totally fine. But I think especially for those of you who are just thinking about jumping in, you can just get, you know, whatever $10, $20 thermometer from the drugstore and start there, you know, and then if you decide that you want to upgrade later on, then that's totally fine. And so, you know, the basic requirements of a thermometer are you need a thermometer that will go to at least one decimal point. Now, you know, the vast majority of the thermometers that are made these days, especially where I live, all have to two decimal points. So for example, 97.23, And so if you can get a thermometer that, you know, measures to two decimal places, then that's great. And you can actually just round that up or down. So for example, if it's 97.23, then you would round it down to (laughs) 97.2. If it was 97.25, you would round it up. So 97.3, if that makes sense. So just like math class, you know, 0.5 and up or 0.05 and up, you round it up and then 0.4 and down, round it down. But yeah, so that's kind of the basics. Now, there are a lot of different options. There are thermometers that have backlights and memory. There's thermometers that sync with Bluetooth to your cell phone. There's thermometers that you can wear. There's thermometers that interchange between Fahrenheit and Celsius or or whatever the case. So there's a lot of different options. And the price the prices range from, you know, $10 to 400. And so at the end of the day, I think the important message I want to share is that it doesn't, you don't need to have a fancy thermometer to chart. There's a lot of features that are not, you know, required or necessary in order to, to chart effectively to take your basal body temperature. 
And so it really comes down to what you want. And so for some women, the act of taking the temperature every day is made a lot easier if you can just wear the thermometer. So, you know, wearable device then makes a lot of sense. A lot of women really want to have a fancier thermometer that syncs to, to their phone and Bluetooth for convenience. So there's a lot of convenience factors. But at the end of the day, just remember, you know, if that is what's holding you back and you think that you need to have this like $200 thermometer in order to get this done, you don't. You can just start with the, you know, just go on Amazon and buy a thermometer that measures to two decimal points and start there. And if you decide later on that you want the fancy one, it'll still be there. So there's no rush. Okay, so number two, what is a normal pre-ovulatory and post-ovulatory basal body temperature? Well, I think that this question is always interesting to me because your post-ovulatory temperatures will always be relative to your pre-ovulatory temperatures. And so what that means is that if I'm working with someone whose pre-ovulatory temperatures are really, really low when they take their BBT every day, then their post-ovulatory temperatures aren't going to be in the normal range either. So I think that's something to keep in mind first and foremost, that they're relative to each other. It's not like you're going to ovulate and your temperature is going to go up two degrees or something like that. It it just doesn't work like that. And so if your pre-ovulatory temperatures are low, then chances are the post will be low as well, just to kind of put that out there. But what we're looking for in terms of, you know, is my temperature normal, is that before ovulation, your average temperatures, the majority of them should be over about 97.5 degrees Fahrenheit, 36.4 degrees Celsius. And so, you know, if you have one or two that drop below it, but the, you know, the majority of them are above it, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong. But if they're all consistently, you know, at the bottom of the chart, and, you know, you've got a lot of temperatures around the 97.0 or less, even in the 96 range, even if you have seen that you have temperatures that are that low and you've, you know, had your, you've, you know, gone to the doctor and you've had everything tested and everything's fine. If the temperatures are consistently low and the vast majority of the time are quite, quite below that level, then it is something to, to look for. And so just, you know, go back and have a listen to episode 124 with Dr. David Brownstein, where he talked about thyroid and how it's important to look at both the actual body and physical symptoms as well as the labs, because a person can have normal labs and still have an issue with their thyroid. But just to put it out there as well, you know, if you're taking your temperature the regular way and you keep the thermometer in your mouth for 30 seconds before you click the button, it's possible that the temperatures aren't actually low and that you just need to hold the thermometer in your mouth for long enough to get an accurate reading. So before, you know, you jump to conclusions, I would suggest to just make sure you're taking your temperature accurately and uh, just so that you can kind of rule that out as one of the reasons why the temperatures might be artificially low. And so for those of you who are going to be annoyed if I don't provide a post-ovulatory range as well, um, I would say that, you know, in a healthy cycle, again, first of all, the pre-ovulatory temperatures would be in the normal range. And as far as the post-ovulatory temperatures, we would expect them to be even higher than that with at least one temperature hitting either on or near 98 degrees Fahrenheit and or 37 degrees Celsius. Now on to number three. Does my BBT help me to predict ovulation? So this is something that we actually covered, but of course I like to just clarify because I think it's one of the myths. Because I can still remember watching soap operas where these women would take their temperatures like in the middle of the day and be like, honey, my temperature rose. And so maybe that was just my experience or maybe I'm dating myself. But um, so I already mentioned that the basal body temperature doesn't predict ovulation because it actually increases after ovulation. So it increases because of the progesterone surge that happens after you ovulate. And I know that there's some resources out there that talk about kind of this dip that you'll see before ovulation. And I remember when I first started charting, reading about that and kind of waiting to see if I had this characteristic dip in temperature before the spike. And what I can tell you after years of supporting women to chart their cycles and just viewing what is a typical pattern, what I can say is that it's not a reliable thing. The vast majority of women, even if they have a dip, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is related to anything. Because once you start taking your temperature every day, you'll see that it fluctuates. It kind of goes up and down and up and down. And it shouldn't be really erratic and going up, um, you know, half a degree or more on a day to day basis. But I mean, ultimately, it does fluctuate. And so often when you have a dip or something like that, it really has nothing to do with anything. So what I would say is that 
the basal body temperature, it does not reliably help you to predict ovulation at all. It's really a tool, it's a retrospective measure of fertility that helps you to confirm that ovulation has happened. And so when you're trying to get pregnant, it's really helpful because if you're paying attention to your fertile signs and they, they should match up, if by waiting until you've confirmed ovulation to say stop having sex when you're trying to conceive is really important because uh, especially for women who are who have been told you know ovulation happens on day 14 and they're kind of having sex based on that idea often they may stop having sex before they've actually confirmed ovulation and so if ovulation happens say three or four days later they might be minimizing their chances of conception so taking the temperature to confirm that ovulation has happened even though it doesn't have any predictive value is helpful when you're trying to get pregnant because it still does help you because it basically tells you no <laughs> we haven't hit it yet you know no you haven't ovulated yet until that temperature actually rises and stays high and now on the flip side, when you're using fertility awareness to avoid pregnancy, well, waiting for that confirmation of ovulation, given that pregnancy isn't possible after ovulation has come and gone, after the egg has come and gone, there's no egg for the remainder of the cycle, pregnancy is not possible. And so when you're avoiding pregnancy, the temperature is also very helpful at helping you to just, you know, pinpoint and as accurately as you can, you know, from the comfort of your own home, confirm when ovulation occurred. Now let's move on to number four, which is how do I tell that I've ovulated? And so, you know, although there are different fertility awareness-based methods and there's kind of nit gritty details that are different amongst different methods, overall, in order to, to confirm ovulation, what you're looking for is a shift in temperature that is clear and obvious. So when, you know, if I look at your chart or if, you know, any random person looks at your chart, what we should see are so, like a clear difference between your lower pre-ovulatory temperatures and your higher post-ovulatory temperatures. And so, you know, to put it more specifically, in order to confirm ovulation, what you're looking for are three normal temperatures. So temperatures that are not questionable. It's not because you had a drink, you know, a glass of wine or something the night before. It's not because you had an allergic reaction or something, but the temperatures are normal, but they're high and they're higher than, you know, your previous six pre-ovulatory temperatures. So when you take a look at your temperatures, especially after you've been charting your cycles for, you know, a few a few months or more, then you'll start to see that your pre-ovulatory temperatures tend to fall within a certain range. Now, it's not always exactly the same, but you'll see that there's a pattern of where your pre-ovulatory temperatures typically fall between. And then you'll also see that your post-ovulatory temperatures typically fall between a certain range as well. And so what we're looking for to confirm ovulation is that the temperature has risen and stayed high and higher than those normal pre-ovulatory temperatures. And so that's why it's important to know what factors can affect your temperatures and to have us, you know, as you continue charting, have a sense of what affects your temperatures so that you can, you know, make a note of it, put it in your app or put it on your chart when you you know, do take that drink of alcohol if in your case it does make a difference in your charts. I know I'm picking on that, but that's one of the um, kind of most hilarious examples because for some women, literally, like they have a drink and then it like, phew, and for others, it doesn't make that big of a difference. But it's really about you figuring out what what changes your temperature, what affects your temperature, and then noting it and let, allowing that to help you interpret it. And so if you have if you have the flu right around ovulation, which is super frustrating, but it's like, if you're going to have the flu, it typically happens around ovulation. It's almost like Murphy's law or something. But if that happens, then it just means in many cases that you have to wait longer to confirm yet because you have to kind of wait until it, your illness subsides. And then you can actually take a peek and make sure that you're waiting for those temperatures to verify and or you can pay attention to your other fertile signs that we have not talked about today. So today we didn't talk about cervical mucus or cervical position, but that's of course because we are focused on basal body temperature. Okay, so that is how you tell that you've ovulated. You're looking for three temperatures in a row that are higher than the previous six normal pre-ovulatory temperatures. That's what we're looking for, basically. And the next question is, what if my temperatures are erratic? And so that is something that's really common if your temperatures kind of go up and down and they just seem really zigzaggy and it's really hard to make anything of it, especially if it happens kind of before and off after ovulation, like it can kind of make it look like ovulation didn't happen or maybe ovulation didn't happen. And so, you know, going back to basics, the first thing I would say is, are you taking your temperature correctly? You know, are you holding it in your mouth for long enough before you push the button? Because you'd be surprised at how big of a difference that could make. So if you have a real zigzaggy chart, 
before you, you know, assume that you have some sort of immune problem, just take your temperature correctly for a while and see if that makes a difference. But when it comes to erratic temperatures, if you are taking your temperature correctly and it's still kind of going up and down, what I've seen is it's usually something that's happening that's triggering the immune system unless it's something about, you know, shift work and getting up at different times and things like that. So it really depends on what is happening for you. It's very rare that, you know, I w- have worked with somebody who has such erratic temperatures that it makes temperature taking impossible. That's not really something that I've seen quite a bit. So there's usually an explanation for it or a way to moderate or minimize it. But if, for, for instance, if you have seasonal allergies and for some reason it really works your temperatures and they're kind of up and down all the time, I mean, I would still encourage you to chart at least for a few cycles just to see if, if it, you know, if you're able to kind of learn to understand the pattern a little bit or to see if there's certain things that kind of trigger it off more or less. Because for a lot of women, having that information and kind of seeing what triggers the temperature is a helpful piece of information that can even help them to kind of get a hold of certain habits that they might be engaging in or something like that. So I would say at first, you know, make sure that temperature taking is accurate. Take a, you know, a good inventory, a good stock of what could be affecting your temperature. Do you have any allergies or sensitivities or anything that could be triggering your immune system? And take really good notes. Try to figure out what is happening. And usually just by doing that, it it gets better, but it really depends on your personal situation. Okay, so number six, what if my temperature rises and then falls back? So this is kind of around the ovulation question of how do I confirm ovulation? Like what if it goes up and then it goes back down? And so again, I go back to basics. It has to be clear and obvious. Anybody should be able to look at the shift and see that it's a shift. So if it goes up and then comes back down, it's possible that you didn't ovulate. And so you have to wait until your temperatures line up. So you have to wait for three temperatures in a row that are higher (laughs) than your normal pre-ovulatory temperatures. And if you don't see that, if it kind of goes up and down and up and down, or if it, even if it goes up a little bit and then kind of like if the temperature is quite high one day and it goes down the next day, but it's still not lower than the previous six, that's fine. There's no rule that says that the temperatures are supposed to always be higher than the next or this much higher or that that or anything like that. I think, again, we all have a lot of expectations of what this temperature rise is supposed to be. And I think we can make it a lot more complicated than it should be. But really, when you're charting and you've ovulated, there should be two groups of temperatures. It's just as simple as that. There should be lower ones and higher ones, and the higher ones shouldn't go below the lower ones. When I used to chart on, well, I still chart on paper, so I don't know why I'm saying when I used to, but when, <laughs> now when I'm charting my cycles on paper and I have my, you know, temperatures, my pre-ovulatory and my post-ovulatory temperatures, what I do, you know, when the chart is, when I've confirmed ovulation is I take up my ruler and I actually draw a line across <laughs> the chart to differentiate between the lower and higher temperatures because it's like that. It's such that once, you know, ovulation happens, those temperatures stay above the line. So if in your case, the temperatures are not staying above the line, if you think you ovulated, but the temperatures keep coming back and they're below that kind of dividing line between the two, then the most simple and likely explanation is that ovulation has not yet happened. And uh, I think it's important to take that to heart, especially when you're used to ovulation happening at a certain time. Like if ovulation, if you typically ovulate around day 16, 17 of your cycle and it's day 22 and, you know, the temperature hasn't quite like the temperature rise hasn't quite gotten there, but, you know, maybe it was high one day or something like that. It's really tempting to want to kind of fill that in and make it look the way we think it's supposed to look. But really what you got to do is like wait until it actually looks that way. (laughs) So wait until the temperatures rise and stay high. Okay. So the next question, question number seven, what if I don't always wake up at the same time every day? You know, how do you, how do I manage that? And so this question I get in a lot of different variations. So questions around, should I get up? You know, if I always get up at five, should I get up at five on the weekend? Should I get up, you know, earlier or later, you know, force myself to get up and then kind of go back to bed so that I can take my temperature. So I think to pull it all back a little bit, The most important thing in terms of your health and your hormones is to get enough sleep and to get high quality sleep. So in my opinion, sleep trumps this need to take the temperature anyways, because think about what is beneficial for you, you know, overall hormonally. And so to kind of paint that ideal picture, of course, it's ideal if you're able to get a minimum of five hours of consecutive sleep. And if you're able to take your temperature around the same time every day. But, you know, even if you have to take your temperature an hour, you know, later or earlier or even two hours later or earlier, I would say that the more it's more important for you to, you know, pay attention, make good notes 
So for instance, when you take your temperature, if you usually get up at seven, but today you got up at nine, I think it's more important to just take your temperature at nine and then just write down in your chart that you took your temperature at nine uh, so that you can know that. So for some women, taking their temperature at nine when they usually take it at seven is going to make a huge difference and they're going to see it. But that still doesn't mean that they can't use that information. Other women find that even if they get up a little bit later, it doesn't necessarily make a dramatic difference in their their charts. And so part of body literacy and learning about your cycles and learning about how your cycles affects you is to recognize that uh, every woman is different and your job is to figure out how these things affect you. And so for instance, if you know that getting up a little later affects your temperature, so what typically happens is the longer that you sleep, your metabolism, your resting metabolism raises a little bit. So if you get six hours of sleep versus eight hours of sleep, it's very likely that your temperature would be higher at the eight hour mark than it would be, you know, at the six hour mark. And that's a, so that's a thing. But if you know it's a thing for you, especially when you're charting, you can actually take that into consideration because usually, you know, for example, because the pre and post ovulatory temperatures tend to fall within a certain range, then if you sleep late, you know, during your pre ovulatory phase, that temperature would still be lower than if you slept late in the post ovulatory phase, if that makes sense. So it's still relative to each other because we have two different groups of temperatures. So I guess what I'm, I'm saying is it doesn't have to be perfect. If you don't wake up at the same time every day, then I would say the first thing to do would be to make sure you're taking your temperature correctly <laughs> and to start making note of on your charts of when you typically wake up and if you're getting up a little earlier or later, make a note of that. And then once you've finished a full chart and you've made all these notes, just take a quick look over it and see if you can identify any patterns. Now, for most women that I've worked with over the years, even if you're, te- even if you do get up a little earlier or later, sometimes it doesn't necessarily make a huge difference. So it could, it can, it's possible, but it's, it's typically not that your chart is unreadable. It's typically just that there's a couple of days throughout the cycle that it might be a little bit wonky. And like I said, there's no, uh, I've never seen a perfect chart. I don't actually believe that such a thing exists. <laughs> and so the goal isn't to have a perfect chart. The goal is to start to appreciate the connection between your health and fertility and to learn how to interpret your temperatures so that you can confidently identify ovulation. And then if there's any other information that is helpful to you about how these different things can affect your metabolism, then, you know, you can glean that from it as well. Now, this next question is related to the same, it's related to temperature and getting up. And so I'm kind of putting two of them together, but what if I do shift work and, or, you know, what if there's something that's waking me up at night? What if I have kids at home that wake me up early or wake me up throughout the night and I can't really get my temperature, you know, what do I do then? So similarly to the other challenges, you know, again, like the first thing going back to accurate temperature taking and giving up the idea that it's going to be perfect. Again, this depends on the woman. So when it comes to getting an accurate basal body temperature, we're looking for that resting metabolism. And so even if you're working overnights, if you come home in the morning and you sleep, you know, for five to seven or eight consecutive hours and you wake up at that whenever that is <laughs> 3 p.m. or something. But if you wake up and then you take your temperature, then for some women that could work and it could, you know, regardless of what time of the day it is, it, they could still be getting an accurate reading. So the first thing would be not to assume that it's not going to work, but to appreciate and understand, okay, so ideally five hours of consecutive sleep. So, you know, just taking your temperature when you wake up, whatever, whenever time that is, and then keeping really good notes of your chart. So if you are doing an overnight and then you get up 3 p.m., then note that. And then you can have an opportunity to see, you know, is it possible for me to chart with this? You know, is this shift work disrupting my temperatures so much that I can't read them? Or am I able to still see a pattern even with all this? And some of you may be surprised to find that you can still chart even if even in those types of situations. So uh, similarly to getting woken up throughout the night, if you have kids that are waking you up or whatever the case is, uh, for some women, if you if someone wakes you up once in the night, your temperature in the morning won't necessarily be that different. But for others, it really does make a difference. So again, you can just, I feel like it's just a, a constant theme, but that's part of what charting is all about because everyone is so different and charting helps you to kind of tune into what makes you different and how, what, how different things affect you. And so, yeah, some women get up to pee and it doesn't really affect their temperature when they take it in the morning. Other women get up to pee and it totally like messes it up and they can see every time that they had a disturbance in the night that the temperature is kind of higher than usual or something like that. 
So there's a couple different things you can do in this scenario. So one is to chart anyways, make really good notes, give up the notion that it's going to be perfect. And for some of you who are listening, you'll still be able to interpret your temperatures fairly well. Uh, so it just depends. For others, even if you do all of those things, it's your temperatures may just be sensitive to these different types of changes and it may be hard or near impossible to actually read the chart. It just depends. So if you fall into that category, uh, again, there's a couple of options there. One is to chart, keep taking your temperature and kind of making those notes, which can be frustrating, especially if it's not that helpful. The other is to kind of rely more heavily on your other two fertile signs. So relying more heavily on cervical mucus and or cervical position. So there are specific methods of fertility awareness charting, including the one I teach, where you can be using cervical mucus only, essentially. And so not all methods require temperature. Some methods explicitly tell you not to take your temperature because, you know, for for whatever reason. But it's important to know that it's possible. You can actually chart your cycles paying attention primarily to cervical mucus. And so, but it's usually helpful, especially if you've different fertility awareness methods focus more on mucus. And so it's in order to actually do that and feel confident, you may have to train with a specific instructor or something like that so that you can get much more comfortable with your mucus uh, observations. But, you know, for other women who, for whom especially the cervical mucus might be a bit more overwhelming, this is where those, you know, wearable thermometers come in. And we will talk more about those in the last point. But for many women who are in the situation, getting a wearable thermometer that, you know, syncs to your phone and takes your average sleep temperature, which we'll talk more about, but basically takes the temperature throughout the night, averages it out and spits it out on a graph for you. For some women, that is kind of the best option, especially when it's just too much. If you are a new mom and, you know, your sleep is just, is not happening, you know, your cycles have returned and you're trying to chart, but this temperature thing isn't working, then sometimes the wearable devices are literally the, the solution to the problem. And I'm actually going to switch the order and just talk about the wearable thermometers. And so number nine, what about wearable thermometers and other devices? So one of the things that I like to share about these different wearable devices, and you'll notice that I'm saying wearable devices and not name dropping, but, you know, for those of you in the fertility awareness world, there are a lot of different thermometers that um, there's fancier thermometers that have the Bluetooth sync. There's thermometers that are part of devices birth control devices. So devices that are specifically telling you which days are fertile, which days are not fertile. There's devices that you wear to sleep and they just take your temperature for you. And again, some of these devices are, you know, predicting when you're going to be in your fertile window or just confirming and telling you when you have ovulated. But there's a wide variety. And of course, there are more devices all the time. So even if I were to list a a certain number of devices within a year or two, there's going to be many, many more that I wouldn't have listed. So I'll just kind of let you fill in the blanks there. I think what's helpful to know is, again, the difference between thermometers. So some of the wearable devices that take your temperature overnight and spit out a temperature for you in the morning, I think it's helpful to know that they're not necessarily taking your basal body temperature. They may be taking something called your average sleep temperature or just literally creating and kind of a, and doing a calculation, taking your temperature every so often, and then averaging that out over the night to give you a temperature. So a device that takes your temperature, you know, every however many minutes or, you know, whatever the case, and then averages that and and gives you a, a temperature in, you know, in the morning is that's not the same as your basal body temperature, just so that you know. And so that's not necessarily a problem because it's that number that it spits out is just as accurate in terms of confirming when the temperature shift took place. So in terms of confirming ovulation, both the basal body temperature and the average sleep temperature would be equally helpful and effective. What I've seen with some of the wearable devices is that because, especially the ones that are input with algorithms and calculations that are making averages and cutting out temperatures that seem to be a little bit too you know, high or low or something like that, because this algorithm is designed to even out and iron out those temperatures, that's exactly what it does. So I've seen clients that have like full on thyroid issues and, you know, different problems where their temperatures look perfect with this device. And so it's very helpful in making it easier for you to, you know, see the shift. But if you if you're hoping to glean additional information about your health or anything like that, or, you know, if there's anything you wanted to learn from your metabolism, or if you think you might have an issue with endocrine function or something like that, just know that some of those wearable devices don't give you that option because they're not taking the resting metabolism. They're taking a different temperature. 
And also devices that are not, you know, in the three main locations that we talked about. So like orally, under the arm or vaginally. Again, if, if, the, if their device is taking your temperature from somewhere else, it's again, not necessarily measuring the basal body temperature. And then if it's doing averages. So I think it's just, for me, it's all about information. It's, it, I think that the wearable devices have their place. And I think they can be extremely helpful for busy women who are not having the best of luck with their sleep schedules and or remembering to take this temperature every, every, you know, day, every morning when they're waking up. So I do, ha- I've seen that these devices can be extremely useful and helpful. I just think it's really important to have a, that cl- that clarity, you know, because a lot of women would think, oh, it's measuring my BBT um, and think that it's all fine, but it's possible that, you know, it, they, something could be missed. So for example, the temperature is most well known a way to identify if you do have an underactive you know, thyroid or something else is going on that's causing your metabolism to be too low. For many women, it's charting that helps them to identify that at a subclinical level. And so anyways, so that was the second last point. Let's move on to the last point, which is, should I take my temperature as postpartum? Now, this is something I threw in there because again, I get this question a lot and it goes back to one of the things that we talked about earlier, which is that your temperature doesn't have any predictive value. So it doesn't actually help you to predict in advance when ovulation is going to happen. So you could think of postpartum as a really, really ridiculously long pre-ovulatory phase. (laughs) I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way, but you could. So, you know, let's say that you're pregnant and you have a baby and then you have your several days of lochia, which is the bleeding that you have for several days, you know, after you've had your baby. You know, if if we were just to pretend for a minute that that was your period, then you're entering into the longest pre-ovulatory phase you've ever had if you breastfeed, for example. And so breastfeeding is known to suppress ovulation for a certain period of time. So again, it varies from woman to woman. It varies from baby to baby, how much uh, skin to skin baby's having, how frequently baby's nursing, if baby's getting any supplementals, formula, or just breast milk, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It really depends on, on a lot of different factors. But essentially, you know, charting postpartum is a bit different than charting when you're regularly cycling. So when you're regularly cycling, you know, you have your period and then you start to see cervical mucus, you approach ovulation and then you ovulate and then, you know, about two weeks later you get your period and that can, it continues and continues. But when you're postpartum, it could be months before you start to see cervical mucus again for the first time. And, you know, it varies. It could be two months, it could be four months, six months, eight months, 12 months. You know, for some women, they get their periods back around that year mark or, you know, within that first couple of months after that year mark. If Okay, so just picture for a minute, if that's you, let's say that you get your period back around six months postpartum. Well, that's six months. And if you were taking your temperature every day, that temperature is giving you no useful information. Because until you actually see those signs of ovulation and you ovulate, the temperature doesn't, again, it doesn't help you. It doesn't, it just tells you after the fact. You can think of it in two ways. If you're wanting to gain additional information about your health overall, you can certainly take your temperature just to make sure, you know, thyroid's in check, metabolism is in check, absolutely. But it, in terms of charting and, and helping you to determine your fertile window, it's not going to do that. But one of the things that you could do is if you're paying attention to your cervical mucus observations postpartum, which if you're charting using fertility awareness, that's something that would be required. And I call it being a mucus watch. So if you're checking your mucus every day and, you know, you're kind of hanging out and doing this and you're in the habit of doing that, then when you actually see that your, you know, cervical fluid has returned, when you start to see that clear, stretchy cervical mucus again, or you start to see the lotion mucus, but whatever it is, you're seeing it and you're feeling it and you know that it's there, then that would be a good time to start taking your temperatures when you actually start to see those signs of ovulation, because then, you know, you're less likely to be taking your temperature for months on end. I mean, very few of us would have the patience to just take the temperature for months on end when it's not giving us any useful information. So that brings us to the end. Uh, those were my top 10 questions. I'm sure there are questions that I did not get to. And so if if there's certain questions that you wish I would have addressed, then I'm going to open up a post in the Fertility Friday Facebook group. If you're listening to this in the future, you can always just post a question. It's totally fine. But fertilityfriday.com slash community. We'll be talking about this in there. So I'm just going to go through again, the 10 questions. So the first was what kind of thermometer should I use? The second was what is a normal pre or post ovulatory basal body temperature? Number three is does my BBT help me to predict ovulation? Number four is how do I tell if I ovulated? Number five, what if my temperatures are erratic? 
Number six, what if my temperature rises and then falls back? Number seven, what if I don't always wake up at the same time every day? Number eight, what if I do shift work and or have kids waking me up all night or some other issue that is preventing me from having a, you know, normal steady sleep in the evenings? Number nine, what about wearable thermometers and other devices? And number 10, should I take my temperatures postpartum? So I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. I was thinking about doing an episode about basal body temperature for a while. I've posted, you know, numerous times in the Facebook group to get a sense of what your top questions are of basal body temperature. So I hope that I answered some of those for you today. And I just want to thank you for spending some time with me today as we talked about basal body temperature charting. And I realized I don't think I've ever done an episode just on basal body temperature charting. So I thought it'd be a a treat just to kind of go through and talk about this. Because honestly, these are the questions that I get all the time. I And it's interesting. It's almost like I feel like I've done a podcast episode about it because this is one of the topics that I cover with every client and every group program just continuously. Because honestly, I mean, like I said at the beginning of this episode, you know, temperature, it seems like it should be super, super simple. But because there's so many different things that can affect the temperature and and impact it and (laughs) cause it to kind of fluctuate, it, it does lend itself to a lot of kind of very specific questions of how to manage certain situations. So I do hope that you found this to be helpful. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com slash 258. And of course, today's episode is brought to you by the fifth vital sign, master your cycles and optimize your fertility. When I wrote this book, I, I had a very specific vision in mind. I wanted to make fertility awareness more accessible to women because the thing, the top comment that I hear almost every day, uh, whether it's from you know, when listeners are reaching out to me in however way that they do that is, you know, how come that every woman doesn't know this? You know, how come no one told me this? And why doesn't every woman know this essentially? And so I wanted to create a way to share this information with women. I mean, with the podcast, it's it's a large body of work. This has been in the works for almost five years in September or not September, in November uh, or no, in December, I should say. I just remember because I did or no, I think it's, see, I don't even remember. I think it's December though. But in December of this year, it'll be five years. And, you know, when I first started it, there was so much that I wanted to say and so many different topics that I wanted to explore. And I've been so fortunate to be able to do that on the show. And one of my goals with the book was to compile a lot of that knowledge and to put it in one place. So basically to catalog and organize it in such a way that it would be useful and helpful to you but also to have it in one place. But there was something else that was really important to me and it was really important to me just not to just write another book, to have just another person saying a bunch of stuff. It was really important to me to make the science accessible because as women, we face enough barriers. If we have issues with birth control, hormonal birth control, we don't wanna use it anymore. Some women have a hard time finding doctors who will remove their IUDs and understand if they don't wanna come off, if they don't wanna continue taking birth control let alone women who are wanting to use fertility awareness as birth control when, you know, most doctors aren't educated about it and heavily attempt to dissuade women from using it. So, uh, you know, given the obstacles already facing us when we're wanting to kind of go against the grain, move away from hormonal birth control and look for more natural options to manage our fertility, you know, I felt like the last thing you needed was another resource that just was hot air, just someone's opinion. So with over 1000 research citations, The Fifth Vital Sign is the most comprehensive book on fertility awareness available to date, just given the sheer amount of research that went into it to ensure that you would have the information at at your fingertips. So if I'm saying something in the book, it's not like, oh, Lisa said this. It's really, you can look for yourself and find out where that information is coming from. And so, as I mentioned at the top of the episode, The Fifth Vital Sign is available in paperback and ebook format and also audiobook. And it just came out, if you're listening to this in real time, it just came out in audio format last week. And so if you're wanting to grab the audio version, head over to fertilityfriday.com slash audible. That's fertilityfriday.com slash audible. And with that said, I just want to thank you again for spending some time with me today. I appreciate all of you for spreading the word, helping me to share with other women about the show. You know, every day I connect with women who tell me that, you know, is their sister that recommended the show 
or their health practitioner or their best friend or whoever. And so I really appreciate all of you for sharing the show with your friends, spreading the word about fertility awareness and body literacy, and just really supporting other women to discover the power of their menstrual cycles, their fifth vital sign, because we all need to know. So with that, I will let you go. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend, week, whenever you're listening to this. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting. Mm-hmm.